Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. My name's Ryan. I'm a former commando from the United Kingdom. Today we're going to be reacting to a fantastic video by a fantastic channel. It's titled One US Sub Sinks a Japanese Supercarrier Sinking of Shinano Documentary. Um, this is a, a new channel to me. I haven't, I don't think I've reacted to a video from this channel before. So make sure you go so, show them some support. The link will be in the description as always to the channels that I do reaction videos to. And let's just get into it, guys. Make sure to like, share, subscribe, join Patreon if you want to support even more and enjoy troops let's get it at a little past three in the morning on november 29th 1944 the american submarine uss archerfish fired six torpedoes and sank the 71,000 ton japanese supercarrier shinano yeah, these things are absolutely massive. This is the extraordinary story of how a single submarine, skippered by a then unremarkable captain, claimed the largest warship then afloat. Okay, this sounds pretty interesting. Shinano. The Shinobi. events that led to the attack and sinking of Shinano began years earlier. She was originally planned as the third ship in Japan's Yamato class of enormous battleships. But after the disastrous Battle of Midway in 1942, it was decided by the Japanese Navy to convert Shinano into an aircraft carrier while she was still under construction to be completed in early 1945. You know, we're looking and talking about something that was, you know, created 80 odd years ago, a relatively long time when you think about how far technologies came in terms of military capabilities. But one thing that has changed quite a bit since then that I know of, uh, even talking from the British Navy's perspective, is the conditions in which the troops, the sailors, were uh, subject to on these ships. In 1940, these places must have been absolutely horrendous, guys, okay? They're bad enough anywhere in today. Um, I've been on a few ships myself, you know, served three, four, five months on ships before when I was in the military. And, you know, they're not great, okay? They do cater for your needs a little bit, but all in all, the person caters towards the ship's needs. The ship comes first. So your enjoyment for the ship, it kind of is a secondary third. It's definitely last on the agenda for the manufacturers, okay, and its design. But back in that day, I can't imagine how horrific they must have been indeed. The work to complete Shinano as what would be the largest carrier ever to put to sea were extensive. Once finished, her colossal hangar would host up to 170 planes, That's allowing insane. the ship to act as a central hub for the maintenance and support of an entire fleet's aircraft. Yeah, so you've got like a, a forward operating base on the ocean waves effectively, which is really, really good if you want to conduct um, forward operations in a different uh, land, a different ocean, for instance, or far away from where you're actually going to launch from. These things can be uh, placed strategically in situ and uh, you can operate from um, from this platform okay and, and and operate quite effectively the only downside to these things is you can i believe create something too big and you run the risk of you know if you do actually run into a problem and that infrastructure is taken out of action you lose a lot of infrastructure you lose a lot of military hardware so is big too big in terms of military capability i think in in some cases it actually is it was a hugely ambitious and powerful design, and one that the Japanese Navy got more and more desperate for as the war situation declined through 1944. In need of something to change the tide, the completion date for Shinano was rushed forward to November 1944. This greatly shortened deadline required a furious effort from the workers at Yokosuka Naval Shipyard and it was made even more frantic when the first US B-29 bombers began to overfly the Japanese mainland on reconnaissance missions. Yeah, worrying times when those uh, bombers are coming over, guys. They can not only do the, you know damage in terms of the information they receive on the reconnaissance missions, but they can do damage in terms of the um, hardware that they can drop on the target if need be. Back in those days, they weren't as coordinated. They used to just throw absolute volume at the targets and, um, you know, to, to a lot of success. But unfortunately, a lot of collateral damage at the same time as well, troops. The commerce war against Japan was entering its final, ruthlessly destructive phase, and the Japanese Navy soon became concerned that Shinano would be spotted from the air and targeted with bombing raids. 
They were therefore keen to move the carrier to an anchorage that was less exposed to American attacks. The carrier was rushed out for builders' trials on November 11th and then hastily commissioned into the Imperial Navy a week later. We hear these stories, don't we? We've seen the similar situation with uh, like the Titanic and stuff. These things were rushed out. Deadlines were pushed forward, uh, funding was dropped and stuff, and then at the end you get a, a, a less desirable uh, ship in terms of quality and quality in terms of you know your military capability. You really do need to have um, a good quality hardware on the ocean waves because sooner or later something's going to find you out, and you don't want the submarine in this case doing that job for you, okay? Because it's going to go out of commission straight away. It's simple as that. You cut corners and uh, it comes back and affects you. The ship was ordered to leave Yokosuka on November 28th to head for a safer anchorage at Kure in the Inland Sea. But the carrier's inaugural skipper, Captain Toshio Abe, was deeply concerned at the state of his ship. He requested a delay to its departure, as Shinano only had 8 of her 12 boilers operational and had not yet been able to carry out a whole host of tests to check that each compartment really was fully airtight. Mm. The request was bluntly refused, with the risk from air attacks if the carrier remained at Yokosuka any longer deemed to be too high. And so the aircraft carrier Shinano left Paul for her maiden voyage on the afternoon of November 28th. I can't believe they're even doing this. I know little about ships and stuff, but it, it, even though I know the end result of what happens to this thing, it's making me nervous to think that they actually let that carrier go out of harbour into a different carrier. It's... Um, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why they do that. They must have been nervous at the time, right? They've got to have been. 1944. She was escorted by the Kagero-class destroyers Isakaze, Hamakaze, and Yukikaze. There were more than 2,500 people on board, including 300 civilian workers who were still completing parts of the ship. Mental. It was a risky voyage. No air cover was available for Shinano, so Captain Abe had been forced to try and make the passage to Kure at night, raising the prospect of an attack by American submarines. With a third of her boilers out of action, Shinano could only steam at a reduced speed of 20 knots. This is insane. I can't believe they're even allowed for this to happen. It's as if they were probing these submarines. Especially, you know what the Americans are like. They're going to be watching, they're going to be waiting, and if they're going to get one on you, they'll do it if they can. They're not going to miss an opportunity. Never underestimate the Americans, okay, guys? People have done that throughout time and uh, unfortunately came out the uh, the worst side for it, okay? Never underestimate the capability of the Americans in terms of what they can and want to do. And so she was more vulnerable than usual to submarine attack. By nightfall, the Japanese flotilla was clear of Tokyo Bay and had turned to the southwest, beginning a zigzag pattern that would take them towards the inland sea. At about the same time, the American submarine Archerfish was surfacing after another day spent beneath the waves. Its captain was Commander Joseph Enright, who was on his first war patrol with the Archerfish. Described by the historian Clay Blair as a cautious and uncertain skipper, more than a year earlier Enright had asked to be relieved from command of the USS Dace after losing confidence in his own abilities. Wow. Now though, he was back at sea with a fresh submarine and a renewed determination. At 8.50pm, Archerfish's radar picked up a massive contact 22 kilometers to the north. Before too long, it was visible on the horizon as an aircraft carrier though unlike any other seen before. This video is fantastic, man. This was a huge potential prize, and Enright was determined not to let it slip through his fingers. So he authorized the regular use of his boat's radar to be sure of his target's location at all times as he tried to maneuver into an attack position. Aboard Shinano, the regular emissions from Archerfish's radar could be heard loud and clear, but... So they know that there's a submarine in the waters. The thing is, which I don't get with this, and if any naval experts in the chat can help me out, why did that ch ship go on a course into the open sea instead of just hugging the natural contours of the country, um, of the landmass that they had available to them? Surely that would make more sense. I'm just trying to link, you know, what I would have done in the Marines on land to what that ship could have done at sea. You know, if we ever in doubt and we need to maneuver in a uh, into a position covertly, then, you know, you're going to hug tree lines. You might not necessarily go straight into the open land. You're going to hug cover 
so to speak, in, uh, in the land masses that cover? Or am I wrong for thinking that? Let me know in the chat. Captain Abe was not unduly concerned. A lone submarine was not in his mind a threat. Only a wolf pack of multiple submarines attacking simultaneously could pose a serious danger to such a huge ship. So at 10.45pm when the destroyer Isakaze broke away to close down on the submarine that was shadowing the group, Captain Abe quickly ordered it back into position. He did not want his escort being drawn away by a submarine acting as bait and leaving the carrier exposed to attack by other lurking American boats. Determined to wrong foot the wolf pack he was expecting, at 11pm Abe ordered a turn to the south at 20 knots, away from the enemy submarine. Enright pushed Archerfish's engine to its absolute maximum, but the submarine could only get to 19 knots, and by half past 11, visual contact was lost with the Japanese carrier. Unable to keep up, a frustrated Commander Enright decided instead to keep on his boat's current course, hoping to be in a better position if the carrier eventually turned back northwards. Yeah, that makes At 11 a lot of sense. 11.40, Shinano obliged, changing course to steam due west after an engine fault developed on board, which cut her top speed to 18 knots, slower now than what Archerfish was achieving. Captain Abe was keen now to make progress towards his ship's destination, but once the carrier swung west, it did not take long for Archerfish to regain contact. By this stage, the boat was south of Shinano and could now turn swiftly to stalk the carrier from this direction. As Archerfish was now travelling faster than the Japanese ship, it slowly pulled ahead, positioning itself in an ideal attack position if Shinano came back to her original course of 210 degrees. This is fascinating. Commander Enright and his crew had no idea what the Japanese ship's eventual destination was, so all they could do was wait and hope unable to get any closer on the surface without being spotted again. The yeah, this is the thing. If you aren't in a position to attack that ship, then what I would instantly be switching to is, instead of thinking aggressively, let's try and do a little bit more reconnaissance on it and see where this ship's actually going, because it has to go somewhere soon, right? Based on the speed and everything that it's going. So I would be doing a lot more. Um, if I couldn't, you know, in hypothetical situation, if I hypothetically couldn't attack that ship, I would be thinking, right, let's turn reconnaissance mode. Where's it going? Get eyes on and, you know, come, come back and fight another day, so to speak. Hours ticked by and Shinano remained on her westerly course. Frustrated, at 2.41am, Enright sent off a report to the Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor, giving the carrier's position and course. Shinano picked up this transmission a minute later, and it spooked the Japanese skipper. Captain Abe guessed that it was a message from the commander of the Wolfpack of submarines he was convinced was stalking the carrier, and that other subs would now be lining up ahead of him for an attack. This must be some scary shit. If you're involved in this, on both sides, you know, you are the submarine, it's like... Imagine swimming in open water and not knowing if there's sharks beneath you. That's one of my biggest fears, guys. And I've been in in uh, in in some oceans where there's been sharks there. All right, in a military sense as well. It was um, quite scary. Okay, uh, you know, I, I've got a fear of the ocean and what's beneath me. I think most people have. He quickly decided to change course and, believing it more likely that hostile submarines would be lurking closer to the coast to the north, decided to turn the other way. And so. <laughs> At 2.56 a.m., Captain Abe ordered Shinano to turn to the southwest. Oh, you can see where this is going. This is unbelievable. I know it happened a long time ago, but it's, it's intense, man. Watching from his conning tower, seven and a half miles away, Commander Enright was stunned. The Japanese carrier had turned obligingly onto the precise bearing he had hoped and was now coming straight for them. Unable to believe his luck, the American skipper took his boat across the carrier's new track and swung it around, lining up for an attack on Shinano's starboard side as the 70,000-ton vessel passed by. This is mental. At 3.06, the submarine dived, something that the carrier was immediately aware of as the radar transmissions they had been hearing for the last four hours suddenly ceased. This was a sign an attack was imminent. Seeking to throw them off, Captain Abe ordered a further change in course at 3.10, round to 180 degrees due south. By 3.13, Shinano was just three kilometers from the submerged Archerfish, which was picking <laughs> its way past the escort screen. Determined to press home his attack, 
Enright stayed on his course even as one of the escorts passed directly over his boat without realising he was there, with barely 10 feet of clearance between them. That is crazy. As the propellers receded, Commander Enright wasted no time. He took one more look through the periscope and fired six torpedoes at the Japanese carrier in front of him, before descending rapidly to 400 feet and getting as far away as possible. It was 3.15 a.m. The Mark 14 torpedoes raced over the now very short distance to the Japanese aircraft carrier. At 3.17, as Shinano was completing her turn to the south, the torpedoes reached their target's starboard side. There were four large explosions as two-thirds of the American torpedoes found their targets. This is amazing. The enormous carrier shuddered and it did not take long for Captain Abe on the bridge to realise they had been torpedoed. It was a serious development, but four torpedo hits should not in theory lead to the loss of Abe's ship. Shinano was a colossal vessel, with sophisticated armour and anti-torpedo bulges below the waterline. It had taken 19 torpedoes and 17 bombs to sink Shinano's sister ship Musashi the previous month at Leyte Gulf. Yeah, but this one wasn't ready. That's the key to the whole thing here. This thing wasn't ready. They knew it wasn't ready. They weren't using full power. They didn't have all of their boilers active. They didn't have all of their engines in uh, good work and order. It was restricted in terms of its absolute capability. It wasn't a finished product. So that's why it probably sunk, and we're going to find out. Captain Mikami, the ship's second in command, soon took control of the damage response from the number one damage control center located in the carrier's island. Initial reports were not good. Mikami discovered there had been four torpedo hits, three of which were inside the crucial citadel of the ship, where the most important machinery and magazines were positioned and protected by better armour. At each impact site, the torpedoes though had punched right through Shinano's torpedo protection where it was thinner, just a few feet below the surface. The result was catastrophic damage. At the stern, storage units and an empty aviation fuel tank had been blown open, rapidly filling with water. Inside the citadel, turbine room 3 had also flooded immediately, along with boiler room 3, an adjoining oil tank and the air compressor room. With I can't imagine being on ship at that time. These guys in the Navy, right, get a lot of shit from all of the, uh, especially the infantiers and myself, I was a commando and, you know, you've got a bit of ego about you and you, you give these guys shit, but... What they have to do when shit hits the fan is like no one's business, guys, all right? There's no job quite like it. Being, imagine being on a ship that's getting attacked from torpedoes, submarines, and aircraft. Absolutely horrendous place to be. Give me a rifle and give me the ground any day. Significant loss of life. As water rushed into the ship, it began to steadily list to starboard, first to five and then swiftly to ten degrees. Captain Mikami rang Lieutenant Inada in the hydraulic pump room, who informed him that 3,000 tonnes of water was being pumped into the port bilges to try and counteract the growing list, but that it didn't seem to be working. It was now past 4am and the that's list gone. was up to 13 degrees. Yeah, that thing's gone over, man, 100%. In the bowels of the ship, Lieutenant Commander Miura, the engineering watch officer, was grappling with a situation that was rapidly getting out of control. The initial torpedo hits were bad enough, but Shinano was still steaming at her maximum speed of 18 knots as Captain Abe tried to avoid any further hits from other lurking submarines. This put a huge amount of stress on the already weakened hull and bulkheads the length of the ship were buckling under the pressure. The thing is, what would you do in that situation? Do you just stop and allow you know, the other potential submarines to absolutely annihilate you, or do you crack on? If it was me in charge, I probably would have done the same thing, just hurry up and crack on. The only thing I would have done differently, maybe I'm a little bit naive in this whole thing, is probably point towards land. I don't know how long it would have taken to get there, but you know, you want to be as close to the shore as possible, really, you know, even though he thinks that the threat is in that direction. Next to the already flooded areas, water was pouring through ill-fitting doors and rivets, compromising boiler rooms 1 and 7 fatally. By 5am, extensive flooding was now starting to slow the carrier's speed as the list steadily increased. To 15, then 18, and by 6am, 20 degrees. It's gone. The ship had now healed so far over that the water intakes on the port side were above the waterline, meaning the crew could no longer counter-flood on that side. 
Shortly afterwards, the ship's remaining boilers began to shut down as the fresh water supply failed. Shinano's speed dropped to less than 10 knots. The starboard hydraulic pump room began to fill with water and Lieutenant Inada found he and his crew trapped with little prospect of rescue. This is scary, Meanwhile, man. Meanwhile, on the bridge, Captain Abe now appreciated the serious danger his ship was in. He ordered a course change to 300 to simply head for the closest bit of land he could and try and beach the carrier in shallow water. Hey, that's exactly what I said. Maybe the Navy was uh, the job of choice for me. <laughs> but yeah, you know, it makes sense, right? I mean, I don't know how, how long it would take to get there, but you want to be as close to land as possible, goes without saying, right? By now, the sun was up, and Shinano had travelled about 36 miles since the torpedo impacts, but at a steadily slowing speed. The situation below decks was becoming incredibly dangerous. Engine room 1 had also now flooded, along with boiler room 1. In a desperate attempt to right the ship, at 8am Captain Abe ordered the deliberate counter-flooding of all three boiler rooms on the port side. This provided temporary relief to the list, but with water continuing to pour in, it wasn't enough to save the carrier. At 8.30, the starboard hydraulic pump room flooded completely. Shortly before the waters overcame him, Lieutenant Inada addressed the bridge crew through a voice pipe. I'm going before you, and I will pray for Shinano and her company. An hour later... That, what a hur That's just sent shivers down my spine. Wow. It was clear to everyone that Shinano was going to sink. On the bridge, Ensign Shoda was dispatched to order the crew in the steering station, who had been manually operating the ship's rudder machinery, to leave their posts and head topside. One of those rescued by Shoda was 16-year-old seaman Ishii, who would go on to survive the sinking. More than a thousand crew were now on the flight deck, clinging on as the ever-increasing list once again went past 20 degrees, and the water began to lap at the bottom of the island. At 10.18, Captain Abe, unable to bring himself to issue an abandoned ship order, simply addressed his crew to say, you are all released from duty. Save yourselves. This is genuinely sending shivers down my spine. I, honestly, I'm, I'm getting nerves hearing that. What that, a thousand people on the flight deck, you are released from duty, save yourselves. Wow. Honestly, goosebumps on my skin. Shinano finally went down at 10.55am, with Captain Abe and other officers going down with the ship. The three escorting destroyers did their best to pick up survivors for several hours, but at 2pm they cooled off their operations. Of 2,515 people on board that day, 1,455 died in the sinking. As Shinano that's horrific. I don't care what side you're on. That's horrific. What a story, man. Nano sank beneath the waves. Her attacker made a clean getaway. Archerfish returned to Guam at the end of her patrol on December 15th, 1944. After initial skepticism of Commander Enright's claim, Archerfish was eventually credited with sinking an aircraft carrier of between 59 and 72,000 tons, depending on which source you take. Whatever the size, it made it not only the largest ship ever sunk by a submarine, it also made Enright's patrol the most successful by a US submarine by tonnage of the entire war. Wow. On the Japanese side, the loss of Shinano was a devastating blow to plans to mount a fight back against the Allies. So as not to harm morale, its loss was kept top secret for months, with the survivors effectively interned near Kure, away from the public. An inquiry was convened under Vice Admiral Genichi Mikawa, which essentially found that so many mistakes had been made by so many people that it was fruitless to assign blame. Poor decision making by Captain Abe had combined with shoddy build quality, inadequate torpedo protection, an inexperienced crew and sheer bad luck to create a perfect storm that sent a 71,000 ton supercarrier to the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. Unbelievable, man. That's one of the best, um, best stories that I've reacted to ever. The fact that it's true is phenomenal, guys. I really, really enjoyed that. The one US sub sinks a Japanese supercarrier. I mean, you know, brownie points for the Americans, but what a horrific amount of death that was. So 
you know, just to read you the, the, the description of that, this is the extraordinary story of how a single US submarine skipped by the uh, un, unremarkable captain sank a Japanese supercarrier. This guy who was captaining the ship wasn't really in the best of places in his career at the time. He wasn't really favoured by his men. He didn't even know if he was up to the job. And then, like that, he ended up turning around getting the biggest uh, sinking in, in, in at the time, all right? Like 71,000 tonnes or something. So it just goes to show you can change things pretty quickly. Um I mean, what a heroic story. What a tremendous story, but what a what a sad one at the same time for all the loss of life that was involved in that. Guys, if you like that, please smash the like, share, and subscribe. Patreon link is in the description. We do ad-free, uncensored content. If you made it this far, please let me know in the comments, and I will see you next time, troops. Take it easy. Bye-bye.